Um, well, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming uh, to this debate. Um, my name is uh, Robert Colville. I'm a uh, writer for the Daily Telegraph. Um, so we've had a lot in recent uh, days about uh, Britain's housing shortage. Uh, Ed Miliband mentioned it in his speech. Boris Johnson mentioned it again today. But we hear a lot less about the quality rather than the quantity of housing. Um, Britain is building some of the smallest and often some of the ugliest homes in, in Europe. And that has an often effect in that uh, people see these developments going up and decide that they don't really like development uh, in general. Um, luckily, we have four absolutely planet-brained individuals who will be able to uh, sort this all out uh, extremely easily. Um, uh, going from left to right, we've got uh, Mark Clare, who's the uh, head of Barrett Developments, which is the sponsor of today's uh, debate and also the uh, largest house builder in the country by volume. Um, he's also on the uh, Green uh, Building Council. And um, Nick Bowles, who is the ha Housing and Planning Minister. No, Planning Minister. Just, sorry, just Planning Minister. Um, uh, Alex Morton of Policy Exchange, uh, our host today. And uh, Sean Spears, who's the Chief Executive of the CPRE. So I'm going to ask everyone to speak for uh, no longer than seven minutes, at which point I will start coughing uh, theatrically. Um, and then we'll try to get in as many questions as we can from the audience. So, um, Nick, would you be okay with kicking us off? Um, thanks very much, Robert. And thank you, everybody, for, for, for coming along and, and, and for uh, Policy Change for inviting me to join you. I, I actually want to start by talking something other than housing, because if in any of you in any doubt, those of you who are members of the Conservative Party, um, about why it is great to be a Conservative, then the last hour in the main hall uh, as the lead up to Michael Gove's speech, which unfortunately is happening now, um, uh, and we should all be there really rather than listen to us, um, uh, was one of the most inspirational things I've ever heard. There was a, uh, uh, a fellow from Peckham, which is actually where uh, I have my London flat, who was helped young people um, uh, thrive and become ambitious, who gave the most blistering argument in, in favour of Michael Gove's insistence on, on you know, introducing everybody to the great literature of, of the ages rather than uh, dumbing down and, 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 and patronising people. Um, and then a mother who had been involved in setting up the Bedford Free School, I and mean, I was in tears, I think the whole place was in tears. Um, it, was, it was fantastic. So if you can see it, get it on you know, YouTube or wherever it is, do it. Uh, because if there's ever a moment where you think, oh, God, why, you know, we're always the guys who have to do the tough stuff that people hate, um, that will put tiger in your tank, I promise you. Uh, anyway, um, on to um, the issue of design and housing. Um, I have to confess that I'm very puzzled by this, um, and, and in a sense that's why I'm so welcome this opportunity to discuss it, because I observe, I think is a fact, that, or at least I think it's something that most people will share, which is that the most beautiful places in England, and we'll probably, as many people in this room, will have as many ideas about what are the most beautiful uh, built places, built villages and towns and, and houses. I think most of us would agree that almost all of them were created before the planning system came into effect. And that's a big question for all of us who believe that planning is a good thing and planning has the possibility to to create places that are thought about and that integrate green spaces and integrate community facilities and, and the like. Why is it that we seem, all of these years that we've had a planning system, not to have been able to, uh, to, to, to build places as beautiful as Stanford in my constituency, which is one of the most beautiful stone towns in, in England, or Bath or Edinburgh Newtown, or, you know, uh, Letchworth uh, Garden City, which is, you know, a very different kind, it's nevertheless a, a very, very beautiful community. I don't have the answer to that, but I do believe very passionately that we will not uh, have a planning system that is stable uh, or sustainable until it is one that finds a way to produce beautiful design. Um, and we will not have a house building industry that, that, that gathers you know, a broad level of support until we have a house building industry that produces uh, beautiful design. And I don't believe, and that's one of the reasons why it's so difficult, this subject, is I don't believe that there is any one set. There's, there's one set of principles that, is, that produces good design, or certainly there's not one minister's view of what good design is. And I'll give you, in a sense, my two out favourite outlying examples, which, which I, I use quite often. Um, and I'll be very 
frank with you, I had not expected to admire Pangbury when the Prince of Wales invited me to come and visit. And that's a bit awkward because you know the Prince of Wales and you sort of want to say you love it. Um, and, and I would still maintain that it's not the sort of place that I would want to live. But what I saw was a tremendously well-designed community that the people who were in it loved it, absolutely loved it. The people who live next door to it think that, broadly speaking, it's taken their, their town up, not down. And the people who built it have made a ton of money. Now, as a conservative, that pretty much ticks all my boxes. You know, the people who live in it love it, the people who live next door to it think it's done good for them, and the people who built it made tons of money. Uh, we need to do more of that. The other example I'd use um, could not be more different, and it's probably more my personal cup of tea, is New Hall in Harlow. Uh, it's a greenfield site. Um, it's got lots of different developers working in it. It's very contemporary architecture, though of a hugely uh, different range of different styles of architecture. Uh, you cannot tell for a million years what's social housing and what's not, though there is lots of social housing in it. It's got masses of green space. Mm -hmm. It's got wonderful sort of organic shapes to streets and, and curves and, and, and facades. It's a fantastic piece of design. And so the question is, what can we boil out of the processes that produce those two examples of great design? Because though I might prefer one to the other, I think we all have to recognize that both of them are great design, and that if everything was more like one or other of them, uh, then probably we would be building better buildings. And uh, my very preliminary conclusion is this. Some of them we can easily uh, perhaps achieve, and some of them are harder. The first is that both of them had a <coughs> landowner who was long-term, who was in it for the long-term, who realized that they would make more money in the later phases if they invested more in the design of the earlier phase. So that it was worth putting money into the green space, it was worth putting money into the public realm, because actually that would raise the values of the whole scheme over its whole life and that they weren't in there just for two years and moving on. And that's true of the Duchy of Cornwall, and it's true, interestingly, of the family who own the land that Newhall is built on in Harlow. Now, that's obviously harder for us to, to, to replicate in every case. Um, but what is also true, I think, is that they went through a process of design, uh, of actually how do you talk to people about design, and how do you talk to people about what they want it to look like as a place not just as a group of buildings. And the closest I've come across in my year as planning minister that I think gets us there is the building for life principles that have been adopted by, uh, very much promoted by the House Builders Federation, but also um, lots of other good organizations involved in creating them, and they're permanently being updated. And the good thing about them is that they don't tell you that you have to design modern or you have to design traditional. They tell you the process and the principles that you need to follow to do good design whether or not it's traditional or modern. And, and I am trying to do, and I know that some uh, house builders are, are enthusiastically uh, uh, taking up, uh, is to promote these principles. Um, and whether there's something more we can do without heavy hand of state regulation uh, to encourage more and more builders to do uh, 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 the building for life building, I think would be a very good step. Final question for you. I was in Freiburg in Germany uh, last week, or Lib Dem Conference Week. Seems a good place to go. Um, uh, and um, it, it's a place, you know, the tra it's always hard. You go to another place and they seem to do everything better than you, and you would think, well, what's transferable? Um, and a lot of it isn't transferable, but there's a scheme there called uh, Rieselfeld, which is a big new modern development uh, on a very big site. Um, and the fascinating thing they did there is that they chopped the whole thing, the, the, the city owned it, which helped. They chopped the whole thing up into small plots. They didn't allow any big house builders to have a huge corner of it. They could have more than one plot, but they then had to be pepper potted around the place. Most of the other plots were taken up by individuals building their own house, or by groups of individuals building a very small group of houses or block of flats that maybe four families or six families would live in. Um, question mark, why don't we do that in England, and would it produce more organic, more comfortable, less uniform places? I think it might. That was a bit long, wasn't it?
eight, eight minutes rather than seven, but you, you said uh, it was your final point just as I was about to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yes, I, now, now to hear from Mark Clare. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Robert. Um, first of all, um, we're doing a little bit of uh, market research. You've got one of these on your chairs. Uh, six of our developments. Uh, I will give this one to you, Minister, and you can uh, score it. Be generous, please. Um, four of them are what I would call our standard product range. Uh, two from Barrett's, two from David Wilson's, and two which are, are non-standard. Uh, if you could uh, just mark them up, one being the highest, six being the lowest, leave them on your seats or have them in on the way out, please. Um, I'm delighted to be supporting this critical debate because it's very clear that we need to build substantially more homes. We're building about half the number we need. The good news is that 80% of people uh, polled by Mori uh, agree that we need to build more homes. The bad news is that 40% of those people polled don't actually want them anywhere near them. Um, the housing shortage isn't new, of course. The last five years have made it considerably worse. Uh, but the good news is there has been comprehensive action. The lenders are lending now. Just look at the marketing that's going on. The buyers are back, and they have been for about six months, and the builders are building quite rapidly. Um, the industry has certainly increased its output. We've increased by about 20% over the last two years. We said we'll increase by another 20% over the next three years. We can probably go a bit faster than that uh, if the market continues as it is. Unfortunately, that isn't going to solve the problem because we will still not be building enough homes for a very long time. What we need is more land. Uh, I'll come back to that. We need a faster planning system, but we also need to build better homes. Unless we build better homes, we will not build more homes because we won't get the mission we need. Let me just focus on the better homes point uh, more than anything else. What I mean is better designed, better laid out, better quality, and energy efficiency is a good example of that, cheaper to run for our customers. The good news is that we've used the recession to really re-engineer the business so we are very, very focused on delivering high standards of quality, independently measured, high standards of customer service. And if you look at the stats, you'll see that Barrett and David Wilson are the highest rated of the national house builders and have been for some time. And we have been getting it right far more than we've been getting it wrong. We've also redesigned our homes, uh, and that has gone down very well with our customers because we involved them in that uh, design process. Again, all of that's quite helpful but we need to go beyond just the homes themselves. We need to concentrate on how the developments look and feel. We need to make sure that they integrate with local settlements. We need to make sure that we use the features that exist already, whether that be trees or lakes or water features. We need to make sure that the parking is well integrated, a real issue on a lot of modern developments, and that we are using public transport as best we possibly can. And we need to make best use of the open space between the homes because that often defines a development as a great place to live. I visit a huge amount of sites. Most of them are owned, but obviously competitors' sites as well. And when I walk onto those sites, you don't need to be an expert. You can immediately get a sense as to whether this is somewhere you'd really want to live. And as chief executive, all I really want to build are places where people want to live. Obviously, that's my business. But we, in the business, want to leave a positive legacy. Of course, the, the challenge is, how do we define good design? Well, Building for Life has been around for some time. We have used it in the business for some time. Uh, we've used it to try and lift the standard. Building for Life 12, as the Minister said, has just been launched. Uh, we are training 300 of, our, 300 of our senior managers. It is mandatory. We will not buy a piece of land in our business and build it out unless we can deliver a standard under Building for Life. It's a very, very simple set of rules. They're easy to use. I've done it myself. You don't need to be an expert. But what you will end up with is somewhere which is much, much not a much, much nicer place to live. And that is what we have to deliver. For me, it's about putting customers at the heart of our business, and we do that by delivering great places. So Nick has challenged us, and we've stepped up. I have two challenges, of course, for Nick. Um, we have improved, uh, I think, uh, on a lot of fronts, but one of the areas that uh, is still a drag on building more homes, of course, is the planning system. We've got many sites where it will take us two years to get a consent on a site that will take us two years to build and sell and deliver and finish. If we want more homes built, we've got to have a faster planning system. The levels of certainty in the planning system are very high. We can be very certain we will get a consent, but it takes far too long. 
We have some great examples where we can do it in three or four months, and some terrible examples where it may take years, many, many years. If we want to build more homes, we've got to free that up. The second challenge is around public sector land. Over the next three years, we're going to start to run into difficulty unless we get more land pumped into the system. Land price is going to start to go up otherwise, which is going to start to create the whole housing price bubble that we're all desperately trying to avoid. Public sector controls 30% of developable land. What we would like is for that to be released much, much faster than it currently is. So, the conclusion is, <coughs> if we're to build more homes, we have to build better homes, and we are doing everything we can as an organisation to do that. We believe if that is delivered hand in hand with more land and improving the process of planning, then actually I think by working together, we can deliver far more better homes. Thank you very much. And uh, now, uh, Sean Spears from the CPRE. Thanks. As I feel in the minority of one on this platform, I'm going to stand up so I've got a quicker exit to the <laughs> door should things get difficult. Um, a CPRE agrees we need loads more homes, and we've been putting an emphasis for some time on the idea that if we get better quality development, better space standards, better community engagement, better master planning so communities know the service is going to be there when the houses are built, and an emphasis from the house builders on using suitable brownfield land before they move on to greenfields, then a lot of the resistance to new housing will will fall away and, and a lot of our branches have run design awards, green buildings awards in, in Norfolk and design awards in Gloucestershire and Hampshire and about half our branches uh, run, run award schemes. But I want to address two, two questions. Firstly, is the government doing enough to promote good design and, and good planning in its widest sense? And secondly, uh, the, the title of the um, session is How Better Designed Housing Could Win Over the Nimbins. I just wanted to ask whether if uh, all new housing was of exemplary design and quality. Um, if all of it was on brownfield sites, and if you won over not only the NIMBYs, but also the uh, very sensible, uh, even tempered public interest charities like CPRE, uh, would, you, uh, would you get all the housing uh, that the country needs? And, and by the way, I framed the question, you might guess the answer, but uh, I'll, I'll come to that. So firstly, is, is the government um, doing enough to uh, encourage good design. Uh, Nick is talking about it, which Greg Clark did, and I, I think that's valuable. I think sensible businesses respond to the noises they get from government, and, and I think it's very good that Nick is using what he calls the bully platform to persuade developers to that, that good housing is, uh, good quality housing is, uh, is a government priority. Um, but I think beyond that, the reality is that every developer really knows that the priority that, that trumps all other priorities of this government is to get housing. And that if the developer uh, will say they need more land release, that they've got a scheme with planning permission that isn't viable, uh, or whatever, they, and, and they hold uh, the local authority to ransom, then uh, almost regardless of the quality and almost regardless of whether it's on greenfield or brownfield land, the developer is going to get their way. And um, that's what we're seeing across the country, and that's what we're seeing regardless of the political complexion of the, the local authorities. I, it, there's a local authority, conservative local authority in Lancashire that's just been, who, who rejected a, a greenfield housing scheme successfully twice. It's on grade to agricultural land. There's a big community <coughs> campaign against it. The third time, they were unable to uh, resist it because they are deemed not to have a five-year um, <coughs> supply of, of, of land for housing, and they're faced with costs of over 100,000 pounds now um, for, for, losing, for losing that appeal. And this is, this is happening um, all over the place. On design, there's a very good chapter in the National Planning Policy Framework on design. It's in chapter seven, it's uh, headed requiring good design. And but, uh, a couple of months ago, Eric Pickles uh, rejected uh, um, an appeal or, or allowed an appeal against uh, Sheffield City Council's refusal of 387 Homes. And to summarise what the planning inspector said <coughs> about the council's appeal, the council thought that the site uh, failed to respond sufficiently to the character and identity of the surroundings, <coughs> failed to improve the quality and character of the area, did not represent a high quality design that utilises high quality materials, would not be visually attractive and would not enhance the neighbourhood. And in response, Eric Pickles said that uh, although it wouldn't be innovative architecture, neither when considered as a whole would the development be poor design setting the bar pretty low. 
And actually, I think it was a David Wilson's home development I saw a few years ago uh, outside Bruton in Somerset. Uh, really standard design houses that you could find in Malmesbury and Gateshead, different templates across the country. The Conservative Town Council had rejected that, uh, or wanted to reject that development, uh, was overridden uh, because of the, the, the top-down planning targets of the last government, and they were desperate for a government that would come in committed to localism and allow them, the welly, to uh, impose themselves on the local authority and try and ensure some better design. And, and that, I'm afraid, is, is what is not happening um, at the moment. Secondly, then, is nimbyism the problem? Um, no, and nor is planning and nor is the availability of land. There's enough brownfield land available, suitable brownfield <laughs> land available for something like one and a half million new homes and that stock of brownfield land carries on increasing. And the unpalatable fact for this government and the last government and every government since Margaret Thatcher is that when the country built enough homes, uh, the state built about half of them. And since the state stopped building, we haven't managed to find a model which has made up for for the shortfall. And nobody is going to uh, propose a kind of return to the mass council house building of the past, but we've got to address the structural difficulties in the housing market and not just look at planning and say land release is, is the solution. Uh, we need to look at demand. There was a very good article in the paper by the Observer's architectural correspondent, Graham Moore, uh, a month or so ago. He said, in the end, the most important figure in British housing is the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He can choose to support the decades-old policy of perpetual house price inflation, which see, sees prices, price rises in homes unlike any other commodity as good. It is that policy that's created the current situation, or he could find ways to calm the housing markets and make them more stable over time to encourage other ways of getting a home than the pursuit of a barely affordable mortgage. And I think we know what path the, the country is currently taking. And this is one area where Alex and I, uh, I think, uh, uh, agree. So we need to look at the demand in the housing market. We need, I think, particularly to look at the fact that the small and medium-sized enterprises that had two-thirds market share in the 70s now have about one-third and find it really difficult. And one of the interesting things about Poundbury and Newhall is that both those developers were not developed, but developments were not developed by the, the, the volume builders. They were developed by small and medium-sized enterprises. But they, those businesses are increasingly in trouble. Um, I think the government has put all its eggs in the basket of thinking that if it supports the volume house builders like Barrett's, it will get the number of houses the country needs. And there was a very interesting report that came out uh, last month from Shelter, uh, which looked at the strategic priorities, quoted the strategic priorities of the big builders from their annual reports. Um, Red Row, uh, to increase margins, raise the average selling price, and maintain the quality of their land bank. Persimmon, our strategy is to continue to optimise the scale of our land bank to a size that supports the level of <coughs> trading achievable within the current market. Uh, Taylor Wimpy, we continue, continue to prioritise both short and long-term margin performance ahead of volume growth. And Barrett's, our strategy remains to rebuild profitability and reduce overall indebtedness. And not surprisingly, as private companies, none of them see their job as building the number of houses the government needs, nor building them to the quality that Nick and I and others would would want. So I think we need to look at the nature of the housing market, we need to look at the SMEs, we need to support schemes for self-built housing, but what you can't do is just simply think that if you beat up local authorities, release more land, uh, weaken the planning system, then you're going to get either the number of houses the country needs or the quality of development the country needs. And finally, Alex. Uh, I'm going to start by agreeing with Sean. Beating up councils is an awful way to get the number of houses you need or the quality of housing you need. Um, housing is in crisis. We build about 100,000 homes a year. We probably need to build about 300,000 homes a year, of which only about a quarter is immigration. That always comes up. Um, but basically, the majority is the fact people are living much longer, which is a great thing. Um, we haven't built enough and we haven't had sufficient quality for decades now. This isn't a short-term party political thing. I mean, there was interesting, of course, a period where the private sector did build enough homes. In fact, it was almost every decade before the introduction of the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, which effectively abolished the market in this country. The market for housing in this country is controlled through the local brand process. Whether you think this is a good thing or not, that is in no way a real market. The idea of the local plan is that a bureaucracy plans, rather than having private individuals who come together and work uh, an agreement that suits them, and you replace that with a coercive plan 
The idea behind the 1947 Act was that the government would not only plan, the government would also earmark land and then build on it. Um, and not that much has changed. The only thing that's changed is that now we rely on the large house builders uh, to deliver it. We still have huge amounts of endless micromanagement, and the system is essentially based on the idea that, that government knows best. And so when Ed Miliband talks, for example, of forcing councils to build up more homes and forcing uh, and compulsory purchase and all the other sort of top-down approaches that he's been going through, he is ultimately taking the, the current system back to its roots. And the, that is a, an intellectually coherent framework, and it built enough homes in the 50s and 60s, but they were god-awful in, in terms of the concrete monstrosities that were often inflicted on the people of this country. And that's ultimately where we'll go back to. If we go back to a centralised planning system, there's no way that quality will be the, the ultimate um, arbiter. The idea that communities are overruled by local by planning inspectors, that's exactly how the system is designed to work. It's designed to be a centralised, top-down, um, directives come from the, the, the top, or in the case of the local council, uh, due to an evidence base that is set by the top. But that's also the, the case in terms of quality. There is huge amounts of micromanagement. The MPBF does talk about design, but by God, it talks about everything under the sun. Uh, you know, you look at the, the guidance on design quality over the past 20 years, there's reams and reams of, of, of stuff about design. There always has been. Has it actually had you know, a blind bit of notice? Of course not. Um, it, it ultimately, a planned system prioritises the numbers over everything else. So what you need to do is, is to try and move away from that. The two homes that are sort of at the side on the TVs are illegal under current planning and building regulations. For a start, they're almost certainly not zero carbon. Uh, that one has raised stairs. The, the stairs are pro inside are probably at an angle that is not permitted under access requirements by most local councils. That one is far too low density. There's actually a two-car garage, which most councils wouldn't plow. I could go on and on. The list is endless. Would most people object to housing if it looked like that and came with parks and some kind of amenity for their community? No, of course they wouldn't. So we have to stop talking about quality in a sort of nebulous way and actually go, what are the structures that are going to give people the control in a system that means that you can build more homes? And uh, you know, that explains why NIMBYs are angry. And to be honest, you know, I get quite angry as well because the system is about pushing people around. And it's, it's sometimes about people pushing people around saying, no homes near me ever. Um, and it's sometimes about people saying, you're going to have stuff imposed on you. The problem is it isn't a kind of consensual bit where they say, we could accept some homes if they look like this and they come with these amenities and say that they could be some custom built homes for our kids because we do need kids, we do want our children to be able to, to stay in this area or they come with a retirement home. So what we argue for is basically the dismantling of the 1947 Act and the, uh, the creation of a system where local referendum by warden parishes or smaller, smaller for Brownfield because uh, there's less of an issue if, if you want to redevelop a Brownfield site and your neighbours don't object. I don't really think it's the governor's job to get in the way or not. And the problem is that the current system almost wait, you, you wait for the five-year land supply to tick your box. The current system crushes almost all uh, initiative out of the system, whether that's the initiative of the developers, whether that's the initiative of local communities, whether that's the initiative uh, of local people and, and planners. You know, we had planning well before 1947. You know, Pimlico, Notting Hill, Edinburgh Newtown, but they are privately planned, and they work in a way that since 1947, since the state decided that it would create a centralised planning system, has not worked. So uh, if most people feel that they are being told what they have to put up with, of course there is going to be kickback within the system. If instead you control what a new housing look like in your area, I mean, like I said, I, I would, and I would get rid of basically all planning regulations, apart from things that, basically, that, that keep a house from falling in on its occupants. Other than that, if local communities want to build something that looks like you know, something from, from um, the clangers, I wouldn't care. If that's what the local community in that area think is really beautiful, that's great because people move to different areas because they have different ideas of what beautiful is. Some people love low density suburbs. Other people love sort of high density London. As Nick said, we all have instinctive reactions. I mean, but usually what we can tell is if it, if it works or if it doesn't. We can usually tell either I like it or I don't, and it works or it doesn't. And sometimes we can tell I don't like it, but it probably does work, and I could imagine why someone would want to live here. Um, so when Nick talked about long-term landowners, I want to make sort of the people of this country and each community, they are the long-term landowners. They moved into an area because they liked it and they cared about it. And if you work through a system of direct democracy um, and neighbor planning, which is a truly great innovation of this government, and, and Nick and Greg Clark have put a huge amount of effort in pioneering it, and I think it's by far the best thing they've done. Um, that idea that you have local communities controlling it rather than a centralised system, I think is the only way you get to um, quality. And this comes down to, this isn't just about Brownfield and Greenfield, but I do want to talk a little bit about the CPRE and sometimes the Telegraph have been right to criticise the government, which you probably don't hear me, they probably don't expect to hear me say, criticise the government on their top-down planning, 
But then what they've often done is say, so we should keep the current system. We can't keep the current system. We can't keep building 100,000 homes a year that are often of insufficient quality. And the government, and Nick is completely right to keep hammering on at this and saying this is the biggest social and economic crisis facing this country, because it is the biggest social and economic crisis facing this country. If we can move uh, from 0.01%, which is the little figure over there, to 0.03% of undeveloped greenfield land being built on, we solve the housing crisis. If you believe that the people of this country are so unreasonable that building houses that look like that, with parks and playing fields, with new amenities for the school, that they will reject all of them, not just not just 99.7%, uh, 97, but on every single side, you won't get that 0.3 figure, then that Ed Miliband's approach that you have to tell people how to live their lives, you have to have a centralised uh, authority that goes out and says, this is what quality looks like, this is where the homes are going. Yeah, um, I don't, you know, we'll consult you a little bit, but essentially you're going to be told to like it or lump it. If you don't believe the people of this country are that reasonable, that's the only approach that is going to solve this crisis. But the thing is, I don't think that that's the only approach that can solve this crisis. By actually saying to people, we will put you in the driving seat of the planning system, and no more will we have the 47 Act, which tells people um, where things go, what they look like. And I think building for life is good, but in many ways it, it is quite restrictive. It says that you should be, it's quite anti-car, it says you should keep open space, which is great. But for example, as, a, as a, an example of the uh, unintended consequences, on estate redevelopments, so uh, we did a report called Create Streets. I'm going to have to hurry okay, I'll, I'll finish the last little bit. But just one example of unintended consequences. Um, you can't, when they knock down the concrete sort of crumbling slab estates that, by God, we need to knock down and, and get those people rehoused and something better um, over the next 20 years, we can't rebuild a sort of like Georgian terrace grid system because one of the requirements, for example, in the London plan and lots of and some of the other plans is you must keep open space. So all you can redo really is basically rebuild in a sort of new shiny tower. So all you've done really is change the fact that it was concrete and now it's glass. That is just one example of the, the how micromanagement in this area, rather than giving control, final control to local people, creates um, resentment and stops us from building both the homes we need and the quality that we need. To, to all of our speakers. I think we've got the traditional um, roving microphones. Uh, but if I can just uh, start off with uh, one question to, to all of the panel, really. Um, you've talked a lot about design, but what hasn't one thing which hasn't been mentioned is size. As, as I mentioned at the start, uh, Britain does is building the, sm the smallest homes in Europe, and it's not very uh, useful having the prettiest house in the world if you can't uh, fit uh, your, your family into it. Um, do you think this is an area, does, do any of you think this is an area where the government needs to toughen up the regulations, or is it best left to the market to decide. I think you'll have disastrous unintended consequences like most of this micromanagement generally does. I, I don't know what those consequences are, but by God, they'll be there. And in most of the countries, they manage to build decent homes regardless of whether or not they have space standards if their planning system works and is based on a system of much more consensus. Sure. I think most countries do have space standards and, and I, I've introduced them as Boris Johnson wants to and as the RIBA report suggested. I, I think this, the tiny homes and tiny rooms are one of the reasons that people reject new developments. You get small gardens, I think. As there's the first unintended consequence, you get tiny little gardens and they'd be overlooking other people because you'd, have, you'd probably cram in more home. Well, Georg homes. The Georgian squares, which are high density, meet uh, good space standards. I, I think it can be done. I, I, I gave Nick the book and showed how it could be done. Uh, Nick's going to book. Um, well, I mean, I, 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 I think the, uh, the reality is that as a, as a developer, we, we offer customers choice. You know, they can have a smaller home, if that's what they want, they can have a larger home, I mean obviously we've got the, the complete range. Uh, when you're in central London and the cost of the land is such that uh, it's very, very difficult, difficult to, you know, to afford a, a larger a larger home, a larger apartment. So we have to provide choice. Um, and we, we survey our customers all the time in terms of you know what they like and what they don't like, including design. Uh, and I think today what we're doing is we're serving their needs. The average house size has gone up for us over the last four or five years as we've moved away from PPG3, which obviously required higher density because we couldn't release the land. Uh, and today I think you know, all of the information that we receive back from customers suggests that actually we're getting it about right. One of the things I always find fascinating about conversations about housing and planning, particularly in conservative audiences, is that generally speaking, we believe in the power of the market. We believe it's very hard for governments to fuck the market. Not that you never should, because there are many cases where in life we do, but that it's difficult to do that, and it has unintended consequences. And I think if I put to you that um, if government imposed a tight restriction 
on the amount of flour that could be delivered to bakers in any year, you wouldn't then be surprised if a couple of things happened. One of which is that bread would become more expensive, and another thing that would happen is that loaves would become smaller. Because basically people wouldn't be able to afford as much bread as they kind of hoped to have otherwise. We should not be surprised that we build the smallest houses and ever shrinking rooms because we have the highest development land prices anywhere in Europe. And why do we have the highest development land prices anywhere in Europe? Is because we allow so little land to be made available for development. So we end up in this very vicious circle. We help, hate everything that's built. So we object to being any more land being built on. So we end up building ever smaller, nastier homes. So we go on objecting to things being built. Perhaps if we would move to a situation where we were just a little bit more relaxed about letting new land be made available. Yes, ideally brownfield land, but I'm afraid Schwartz figure is simply in incorrect. It's an old figure based on very bad research that is entirely untrue. There is not enough brownfield land to build all the houses we need. If we don't provide enough land, we will go on building tiny houses that everybody hate. If we provide a bit more land, we will still have 90 92% of the English countryside entirely without any development, even as a garden, will have happier families and we won't have this endless argument about why our houses are so horrid. Um, on which I will open some sort. If you um, have a particular, uh, well, if you also like to uh, identify yourselves and if you want to address a question to a particular member of the panel or members, uh, please feel free. Uh, the gentleman just here. <clears throat> My name's Bill Grimsey, I'm an ex-retailer, I've just written a review on the high street and I'd like to congratulate you for the pictures up there. I'm sure most of the people in Britain would aspire to houses like that one. But um, my question is for Nick, uh, because I applaud the statement you made, I think four or five weeks ago, on how to use town centres and empty shops and housing. And we've talked about the housing crisis and our town cities, towns and cities around the country are, are failing, um, mainly because not enough people in them. Um, and one of the options is to take redundant properties which are going to grow in the future and convert them to housing, which uh, is um, something that's needed to be part of a joined up plan. And I'd like to know, um, since you came out with that idea, how far you've got and what you've done about it. <coughs> Do we, are we take one at a time? Yes. Uh, you have a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, th th thank you for that. Um, and you know, one of the things that I'm very, very keen that everybody understands, because I, you know, accept and share the desire to, to protect as much undeveloped countryside as we possibly can while meeting our moral obligations to the next generation. So I, my starting point is any building that exists and any piece of land that has ever been built on, let's try and make the best possible use we can of it. And I have to say, Sean, is why I was quite surprised that the CPR really opposed the idea of making it easier to convert commercial property that is redundant and undervalued in town centres opposed the idea of making it easier to convert that into residential. Because surely, logically, if you have more flats going into old office buildings in the centre of towns and cities, that's fewer houses you need to build on green fields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, We've done this, we put in place this uh, permitted development, right? There are, There is a prior approval regime, because of course there are going to be some places that it's inappropriate and it's unsafe uh, to actually put a, a residential property, but it's a relatively narrow set of issues. We are consulting currently on two further um, uh, relaxations, and I look forward to receiving the CPRE's support for these, because they're both about using existing buildings for housing, so we have to build fewer buildings on greenfield land. One is for retail to residential, uh, and the other is for agricultural buildings that have become you know, impossible for modern agriculture to go to residential. Again, on retail, it's really important to say this. We're not saying that there's a complete free-fall, and in the middle of the high street, you can turn it into a, into a house. What we are saying is that councils need to think about what's their real core town centre that they want to boost, they want to drive activity into it all. Um, and what is those sort of straggly streets that lead to the town centre? We all know them, every single market town has them. But frankly, that we should be more relaxed about it. If they want to go on and run it as a shop, fine. But if the landowner thinks, actually, I can get better value and do more social good by making this into a block of flats, 
then let them do it. And I hope that that will begin to, to move things in the right direction. I suspect what you're asking is, as apart from liberalising, is there anything more proactive we should be doing? And that's slightly more my colleague Mark Prisk's area. But my view is that at least planning shouldn't get in the way of using the buildings we have to make as many homes as we can. I feel that Sean probably deserves a quick right of reply if he wants to. Well, on, on these particular things, I, I think the um, shops, converting shops to housing is, is very sensible to do it within the planning system. Lots of local authorities want to do it all, all, and lots already. Don't, sure. Well, not, lot, <coughs> lots don't, but that's localism. That's the wonders of, of local democracy. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think the, the uh, converting uh, redundant farm buildings into housing creates much more, potentially, much more of a problem uh, because uh, you, you've got to think about the, 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 the traffic, you've got to think about the sucking life out of towns, you've got to think about whether um, mm -hmm. farmers will put up barns in order to have them converted. There was a barn we, we found in Somerset which was built with two stories with windows all along it, just waiting for, it, for permission to convert it into an office. So you have to be quite careful about, about how you do it, and that's why we have a, a planning system. Can I, can I kick in on this? Because it was a policy change paper that said let's liberalise some of the change of use. And it was surprising that some people who we hoped would support it didn't support it. And it's great the government has taken it forwards. I mean, ultimately this comes down to what is the planning system for? And the defenders of the current system, and uh, it's a perfectly integrated consistent position, and Sean is one of them, it believes that the council is better at telling people what to do than everyone else. Or central government. And said, so, no, not central government. You believe local councils are better than individuals and their neighbours in coming up with a solution that suits them. And this is a case in shots because you believe that rather than a property owner saying, I want to turn to a house, neither my neighbours object, so let's go for it. You think that it should still be, uh, you should still not allow that through the, count, the council saying, well, actually, we think it's important, this remains a shop. And I don't think you can, in a, in a free economy or a free society, have that kind of control of people's property rights. And that is why the planning system is breaking down. Would the same apply to rural pubs? There would be no pubs in any village around if, if you could just go One of, one one of the guys, problems. we should probably move, move on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, the lady there. Yeah. 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 Um, Sean, Charlotte Davis, Housing Council. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm going to about half the rural land in England and Wales, and um, we like converting our um, redundant agricultural buildings into houses um, and offices. These buildings can't be used often for um, anything in modern agriculture, and we very much welcome um, the current consultation. We do have a slight concern, Minister, that under the current consultation, if you choose to um, convert a redundant farm building under committed development rights into up to three residential properties, you then for 10 years won't be able to put another agricultural building on your holding um, for, t for 10 years under the committed development rights. And we're concerned and we have spoken to a lot of our members who say if that's the case because 10 years is so long, they just won't use the housing element of it because they can't run the risk of not being able to <coughs> adapt their agricultural buildings as they need to. Um, and so we're hoping Sorry, that's something you'll look at. I mean, I'll, I'll just answer that very quickly. I mean, it, there's a balance, and, and, and Sean was right that we've got to be careful about it, and the reason we are being careful about it, so we are uh, making sure that firstly it needs to be a building that already exists, so they can't just use their permitted development right to put up a new shed, put it up, and then a year later convert it into three properties. And secondly, we want to withdraw the permitted development right to put up a new shed, so that there isn't a sort of blatant, oh, well, actually, I am using this for agriculture, but look, if I turn it into three houses, I can always bung up another one next year. So that's why there's got to be some limit, because uh, otherwise we'll just end up with you know endless new barns uh, in corrugated arms sprouting up all over the countryside. But the debate about whether it's 10 years or some other period of time is one we're very open to. That's why we're consulting. Them. <coughs> so the three gentlemen uh, at the back there, if we, if we could just sort of go along uh, quickly to try to get as many questions in, and if people could please keep their questions short. Um, I have three words for anybody who thinks the government should build homes. Robin Hood Gardens. Get yourself down to Tower Hamlets, junction of the Blackwall Tunnel and the A13 and just sniff the air. It's not delightful. Um, a suggestion for you, Nick, a pilot. Permitted development for any scheme up to 30 units where the developer has the written form, formal written consent of the neighbours and all the appropriate Section 106 seal, seal obligations are met. Go back to the system we had before where neighbours agreed it with themselves. Give them permitted development rights for that as a pilot. Try it. Chris Brown from Igna Regeneration. We're importing the um, Dutch and German models of custom build into the UK at the moment. Um, question for the panel. Uh, what do they think the impact on developers would be if there were published 
building for life league tables showing how all the different developers performed. Uh, and one for Nick. Um, how could you encourage the Homes and Communities Agency to deliver high quality design when they're selling public land? Uh, Alan Young from Guildford. Uh, I'd like to pick up on this question of the alleged dysfunctionality of the housing market because it seems to me we have a large number of house builders in this country, one of whom is represented today. Uh, they all compete fiercely with each other. Um, and what I don't understand is why the market isn't working in respect of what you would call good design because if customers want it, uh, these companies who are competing with one another ought to be responding to that. And I'd like an explanation of why does the panel feels that isn't happening. Well, should we go to left to right on those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on that last point, uh, I mean, the last uh, five years, I think house builders have had a wake up call. We've had to um, get our act together in terms of design. Um, and I think the quality of what's being built today, and there's plenty of external measurements of that, um, demonstrates that, that actually things have improved dramatically. I think the danger point now is when we're all rushing for volume again, and are we going to see that decline? You know, I am very, very clear that, that, that for, you know, for Barrett and David Wilson, we are going to continue down the path we, 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 we continued on. You know, we can sell faster, we can probably make as much money as somebody producing a bad quality home, and that's what we're going to continue to do. But if we're going to break through and get more people to accept new development, we have no choice. We have to, 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 to follow on this path. I mean, just the, the point about building for life. We have lead tables for customer service. I'm pleased to say, well, you know we're the largest, the, the uh, highest rated house builder is, I don't need to say. Um, we, we have uh, lead tables for quality. Um, you know who the largest, uh, the, the most successful house builder is, I don't need to say. I'm very, very happy to do building for life. But there's only one major house builder that's doing it today. I mean, th there are a number that are starting to do it. I know that the HBF are working on a scheme that there's an accreditation. I would be all in favour of that. So when we go to a planning committee or to a local community, we can say this has actually gone through a process. As long as that then lifts the standards of the whole industry, I think that would be a very good thing, and I would be delighted to uh, uh, to participate in that sort of process. Yeah, um, uh, John, you tempt me, uh, but um, uh, uh, that's a, I mean, it's quite a. a a brave one, shall we say, Minister, um, uh, to have a permitted development right for something as, as substantial as that. Because of, while, of course, the immediate impact is on neighbours, there are broader impacts uh, on the wider community when you have that many people moving into a place, uh, transport, you know, education and the like. Um, there is the fact that one of the ways in which we get contributions uh, to infrastructure needs for a community is through the planning system. Uh, and so you secure your community infrastructure levy, which you, I think you said would apply, but you don't get your affordable housing contribution other than through a planning permission. So there, there are issues, but um, uh, go on coming up with great ideas and, and arguing for them. We are trying to be bold. Um, uh, I think that Chris Hope's uh, attention uh, uh, will suggest that we are sometimes treading quite close to the edge, um, but I think that might one pull, pull me over. Um, uh, the Building for Life uh, leak tables I'd love to have see happen, um, and I think that, that whoever wants to do it, just as long as it's not government doing it, um, would be great. How do you get the HCA to do to do better quality on public sector land? I think that, and it links actually to the point about why is this a dysfunctional industry. Um, ultimately, we don't have enough pluralism. We have it's an overly concentrated industry. Um, in Germany, 60% of all new properties are built by people who hire architects and local builders to build houses and 40% are done by bigger developments. Um, and that's true in many, many countries in Europe. We don't have an, enough of a tail of, of supply chain. And that means we don't get enough diversity and enough innovation. The reason why that is not their fault. Um, it's entirely the system we have. You have to have an enormous balance sheet and the patience of a saint to go through the process of getting planning permission and all of the other consents on a piece of land. And frankly, small builders just can't do that. They can't, they haven't got the working capital. They haven't got the ability to survive that system. So part of the, the we're only going to get higher quality. We actually make it easier for people to work with the system of, of getting planning permission. Um, and that's why, in a sense, my, my answer on, on good design. I really don't believe, I'm all in favor of encouraging um, standards that the industry itself has adopted. I do not believe that government can make people design things well. I think people 
make people design things well, lots of people asking for good design, and lots of people supplying different design, um, and land that isn't so expensive that nobody can afford to do good design. Um, on the building for life, uh, I'm not a huge fan of it. I think bits of it are good, bits of it are bad. It often goes with quality, so people who care about building for life often build nice homes because they tend to be the kind of people interested in trying to build nice homes anyway. On why the market doesn't work, like I said, there wasn't really a market in this, in the, in, a, in the sense of if I want to build homes, I don't one buy the land off the landowner, two go and ask the neighbours and the local community what will they would allow me to build, which is a system we would support. You basically go to the planning system, and the planning system is a series of largely process-driven hoops, and it's always going to be that way because it's a it's a giant bureaucracy. Um, so if I if I'm a developer, I don't really have to convince the, the local people. I do to some extent, but I really have to convince the local councillors, and I have to convince. And even then, if I fail to do that, I know that I can get the planning inspectorate involved, who will be able to basically smash through and push it through, even if it's not of sufficient quality. And I think you do need a system of direct control in this country. I think that. You need a planning system of sorts, but as Nick was saying, people actually do know what design is. Like the idea that, that people are stupid and they can't tell what would enhance their area um, versus what would make it worse, I just think is, is, is wrong. But that is exactly the way that the current system is structured. But I, I thought, John, your idea is a good one. And for Brownfield, I, I think you need wider things around Greenfield because you have to make sure that if you're building on some green space, you're making surrounding green space attractive and open to the public or enhancing it in some way. But I, I ultimately think that that's the only way we're going to get through all this, that we can talk about design and try and codify it in, a, in you know, endless pieces of paper that circulate around the system. But you have to give uh, final control to local people. So to, to, to Chris, good luck with the custom buildings. I think that might shake up the market. Can I just respond to a couple of points that, um, that Nick made? Firstly, on CPRE's Brownfield Research, building in a small island. Uh, nobody has refuted that research, and, and it's based on government figures, Nick. So if you if you think it's a shiny bit of work, Absolutely. let us know because I've not seen anything that suggests it's had anything other than authoritative. On PPG three forcing small housing, that is simply not the case. Thirty to fifty claims per hectare, you can build good quality family homes with gardens if if you do it well, and that's why uh, we did the Georgians did it well. That's why Cornish fishing villages do it well. Uh, it's not uh, impossible to do. The last point on Nick is the idea that um, that, that, you know, that there's a very there's a simple relationship between land prices and house prices. I simply um, don't accept. It may be that land prices follow house prices, and it may be that house prices uh, have uh, relate to something other than just supply. Which is why when you had big housing booms in Spain, in in uh, Ireland, in the United States, until recently. You, you had plentiful land, very weak planning, uh, uh, lots and lots of houses being built, but you also had escalating uh, land prices because it was a bubble. And, and so you need to look at it in the round and not just have a kind of very simplistic relationship between supply and demand. The government, this government's in danger of repeating the mistake of the last government, which employed Kate Barker to look at house price, but said she couldn't look at demand side factors, she could only look at supply. Well, you know, I didn't do very well in my economics degree, but um, even I know there's a relationship between demand and supply, and you can't look at one without the other. Uh, sorry, can I quickly come back on, on that point about uh, where house prices went up in places where there were <coughs> lots of homes, rents did not go up. <coughs> rents are a good indicator of whether there is a supply issue. Why? Because you do not speculate <coughs> in rental. You don't, no one rents a bigger property than you need. People do speculate and buy select, and they do speculate, sometimes they buy a bigger house because they think they might need a family home down the line. So in Spain and in Ireland, rents did not rise and house prices shot up because it was a typical asset price bubble. The UK rents are rising very, very it's steeply. Not I'm not saying it's not the I know, supply. but, but your, your argument that the government is being forbidden, I think you have to take into account the fact that rents are rising and we do need more homes. We know, exactly. We and, do more homes. And on, on the point about 30 to 50 homes, if local people said, I don't want 30 to 50 homes, I want 20 homes at a different low density, I think that's fine. I don't really care as long as the community is happy. What's the position of CPRE? I was thinking it was Nick, oh. and, I was thinking it was Nick and Sean who needed to be. Sorry, no, no, I'm very happy. happy. What's, what's the position of CPRE if local people don't want 50 homes a hectare but they want 20 homes a hectare? Um, what's the gentleman at the front who's been working very patiently and then the two uh, people behind? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael Watson. Uh, one for Alex and Mark here, really. Alex, as a Conservative, I think it's fantastic everything you're saying about letting the locals decide and so forth. But I'm a solicitor who acts for a number of the major house builders, but I'm also a parish councillor of a rural area in West Yorkshire. And if you throw it down to the local level, bring the topic back to NIMBYism, you just won't, I don't think you'll get what Mark needs. Yes, they'll allow four or five of those to be built, 
But if you want anything beyond that, I just don't think the local people will go for it, and therefore you need to do something to override that. Or does that work for you, Matt? Does four or five units on the edge of the village work for you? Can we yeah, yes, I mean, uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, Given our, uh, our, our size as a company, we tend to work on 20 units and above. You'd be talking about smaller house builders, and actually the more of that you can bring forward, the more you're going to activate smaller house builders. I mean, they, you know, they can't cope with the, the larger sites. I mean, the reality is that, that you know, what we're trying to do is to build good quality homes uh, on a mass scale, because that's what this country needs. You will not get there otherwise. You need, you need a large number of companies do that, uh, doing that. You need a large number of smaller companies as well. Um, to do that, we need clarity as to where we can build. And, and a lot of the debate is about have we got clarity as to where we can build. The answer is, well, yes, but it's incredibly long-winded. And is there, a, you know, is there a better system? Can we improve it? Uh, and and you know, that is what is, is, is holding up the growth in housing numbers. Uh, you know, there are 2,000 house builders operating in this country at the moment. There used to be 6,000. Still quite a long supply chain. Um, but, but I think the, the key issue is, you know, I, and I, I disagree with, with some of the comments made. The key issue is we need more land brought forward uh, and we need a more efficient planning process so that we can actually get to that land and get building as fast as we can. And that's what's actually going to deliver 200, 250,000 homes a year. I would pull every other lever. I'd have local authorities building, I'd have RSLs uh, uh, building more, uh, I would want you know, self build, small builders, everything you can possibly do. That is the only way. You are going to get above 185,000 units, which is what this country got to in 2007. I would pull every possible lever. It's not about large house builders or small. You've got to do all of the things to actually get the number of homes built we need. Can I, can I well, a quick respond on the um, the four or five homes? One, it'd be a start. Two, if you went to those people and said, we will build you, especially for retirement homes, so that as you um, have to move out, you don't have to move to local town, but you can move into these nice, attractive homes we've built for you, which would actually free up the family homes. I guess you. I think you'd probably get that scene if it came with some amenities with it, and that's in the, that's the hardest nut to crack. Small picturesque yeah. villages are the bloody hardest nut to yeah, crack. Absolutely. If the nearby town can be, where it's got a not very nice suburb, can be persuaded you're going to build some really attractive houses at the edge of that, to some extent that demand is interchangeable. So and maybe we can't get to 0.3 percent, but I'd like to see a conservative government try and basically say we would like to trust people with this, and if this fails, you know, red it, yeah. Edmund Lamb will come with his central control. But I'd like to see us try before we give up entirely on, on, on people's common sense. We're running slightly out of time, so if the lady and gentleman could be very quick, and I'd ask the panel to keep their answers quite short. And, uh... Uh, Nick Boysmith, I'm the director of Create Street, which is the social enterprise and new uh, property development fund, trying to answer part of this question by doing uh, some large scale development in London and other cities. Um, uh, we were in a time of great crisis. The last time there was a uh, such agreement that such amount of new housing was required, as it is required, led to the 1956 Housing Act, which was not subsidised high-rise, which subsidised multi-storey blocks. There is an enormous danger, and you are completely exempt from this, that both parties will bid themselves up in hundreds of thousands of numbers, what we saw it last week, which will lead to shoddy design uh, over the next 20 or 30 years. Some of the stuff that's being built, put up right now in our inner cities is shocking. We've got a nice brick veneer. All the other design flaws of 30, 40 years ago are being repeated hook Lion and sinker. Well, I've been walking around looking at it, taking photographs. Um, so, point one, point two, very quickly is that there is an answer here, but it is about, it's picking up on Alex's next point, is about freeing up regulation. We're starting to look at what you could practically do to start redeveloping large bits of London at higher density in beautiful homes. But we're finding the London Plan, the London Housing Design Guide, rule after rule, would actually make it very hard to do. You could not put Pimlico in London today. You failed on 30 points. You couldn't put the dense streetscape. It fails time after time after time. That is the opportunity. That, if you like, gets Sean and Nick and Alex all agree. Because if you can start massively redeveloping large bits of unused brownfield in the cities, much less pressure on the countryside. And the, the lady by you, just quickly. Can I just talk to you? Jackie Pendleton Aaron in West Sussex. Um, I agree entirely with what you're saying about the importance of families having homes, good quality homes. However, the one thing that I don't agree with is your uh, blanket approach to defining numbers in areas where there isn't sufficient work to support the, that housing development. And in Arran we have two, even though it's southeast, two of the most deprived towns in the country. We're being forced as a council, local council, to put unrealistic housing numbers into the plan when the houses that have already been allocated 
um, for, for development, you're not selling. There's no work down there. So why is it that there's, there's this blanket approach to development anywhere? It surely should be development where there's work. Otherwise, we're going to end up being a drain on the benefit system. Well, Nicola, can I ask you to lead off on that? I mean, just, just on that, that last question, which is, uh, uh, you know, it, obviously right that, you know, we do not want people to be living in dormitories far away from any work. It's one of the reasons why we can't actually put all the houses on brownfield land in, in cities in, in the north that no longer have the industries and the employment that they once had. Um, we'd all love to be the politician who found a way to move uh, economic activity from one end of the country to the, the other. There's not yet been a politician who's ever managed to uh, do it, because that's not how these things work. Um, all I, just to say is that you know, there isn't a, 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 I don't have a target for the amount of houses in Aaron. I don't even know what is the number that your council has arrived at in its attempt to try and project that very, you know, slightly hard thing to project, which is what's going to happen to the population pressures in Aaron over 15 years. How many people are going to go on living and um, you know their children are going to grow up and want or their great grandchildren are going to grow up and want a home how many people are going to move in how many people are going to divorce that's a very difficult thing to do there is a, a set of methodologies that are followed um, all we in central government say is that you have to go through a process as best you can of assessing objectively what is your housing need and that's a process that every council in cities and in rural areas and in suburban areas they all have to go through it and they all have to use roughly the accepted methodology. It's not, they can't make up some sort of voodoo science. Um, and then they have to identify the sites that will supply five years worth of that housing. That's all we ask them to do. And I don't think it's an unreasonable thing. We don't say to councils, provide as many school places as you feel like. We don't say to the NHS, provide as many hospital beds or as many doctor surgeries as you think that you want to, we say to them, you have a responsibility to meet the needs of your population. We are not going to tell you where, how, how, what sort of housing to do. All we're saying is you have a duty to your population to provide enough housing for your growing population. Okay. And that's what we've said to Aaron, that's what we're saying to every authority. Um, sorry, no, I'm so, sorry, no, I'm re 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 we really don't. Principle sound, process isn't working. Okay. And, and on the Pimlico, on the Pimlico point? I mean, I completely agree with you, as you know. Um, I, you know there are, one of the things, there's, a, there's an amazing guy who lives in my constituency <coughs> in Stamford, which is one of the most beautiful towns in England, in case anybody's looking for a nice uh, weekend. Um, and he's a professor of architecture at Cambridge. And I asked him, I said, um, so why is you know, the design of modern housing, sorry, not all of it, but much of it, not, <laughs> not quite what was built in Stamford by the little local tradespeople of Stamford? And he said, you won't get any great architects working in house building these days. And I said, why not? He said, oddly, it's not so much about planning. He said, it's about all of the other stuff. It's the highways, you know, the amount of turn you have to have on the roads. It's the building regs. It's, the, it's such an, a constrained atmosphere. And I completely buy that, you know, Pimlico probably wouldn't be allowed now. Well, let's make sure that the rules that stop Pimlico being done again are got rid of so you can do it again. Would anyone else like to come in quickly on, on, on those? Well, I can't wait. I'm, uh, the only bit where I ever disagree with Nick is I'm not sure if the local plan system can do it. Because I think ultimately if you have, this, if you have the government saying you have to work out this, you have to do that, who judges whether it's good enough? The central government. What it happens, the bureaucracy gets control. And I think you just have to cut through the whole thing and give complete control to local people. Well, on Aaron, Nick might not um, uh, have a, a central uh, a number for, of houses for Aaron, but the number is almost certainly the same as it was in the southeast plan. Um, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and we're seeing this across across the country. This the the local authorities are f feeling that they are disempowered in Winchester, where there's a brownfield site that's going to become available. They're being made to develop farmland outside the town because it's not yet available. In Mevergis in Cornwall, where the parish council has identified sites for affordable housing, they're being made to give permission to two million pound mansions on the coastal path in the area of outstanding natural beauty to cross subsidise the affordable housing. These Coker and Somerset, the projections are based on 3% growth, economic growth a year. Up and down the country you're seeing local authorities that feel they are not in control of, of their uh, local authorities neighbourhoods and parishes not in control of their housing. We need loads of housing but the system is we include credibility and that's the problem. 
um, unless Mark has any thoughts. I think um, so. Um, yeah, we've got time to squeeze in just one more question, and in the spirit of mischief, um, I'm going to ask my Telegraph colleague, Christopher Hope, uh, to uh, do his worst. Um, I was going to ask the Minister, yesterday you said that if you were Prime Minister after the election, you'd like to be shot. Um, has this, has this, has this war you've waged against planning taken its personal toll on you? Or would you like to share it with us? Do you know what? I just think it's terrible when politicians complain about it. You know, we, we all volunteer for this job. So no, the reason why I said that was I was trying to avoid answering the question, Chris. You should do that. Right? <laughs> um, and the question was, what is the future for further planning reform after the next election? And I thought, I really don't want to go there. So that was my answer. But no, I don't complain about it at all. It's a, it's a wonderful job because it really, really matters. We have to have a mission as a government to build enough houses for the next generation. And I'm very happy to have a small role. I was going to ask you a quick, quick, quick one. If you, if you throw forward just to 2025, uh, where will your 8% figure be on, on England where that's been built on? Will it be... I'm not going to go there, but what we'll have is lots of beautiful homes designed to build to the life standards, lots of self-build, lots of old barns converted into housing, lots of old shops converted into housing, and we'll all be happy bunnies. <laughs> <laughs> and on that uplifting vision, can I thank the panel very, very much.